Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest E4C 2015 webinar series. Our webinar today will focus on how to manage global supply chains to developing countries, and was developed in collaboration with Trade Without Borders and Solageo. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'll be one of the moderators for today's webinar. When I'm not moderating webinars, I work with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and Engineering for Change, where I am the Senior Program Manager. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar, How to Manage Global Supply Chains for Developing Countries. Many of you perceived members reach out to us with poverty alleviating product ideas and questions about taking those products from concept to launch, scaling up manufacturing, and procuring goods from global suppliers. There are recognized challenges associated with global logistics management and the emerging markets where we work in Asia, Africa, or Latin America. Today, we've invited the founder of Trade Without Borders, or TWB, Joseph Fernandez, to shed some light on getting solutions to the last mile. TWB specializes in training services for global suppliers and local organizations within underserved communities and has developed the Solageo platform to expand clean energy access. Joe, we thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series. Along with myself, we have Holly Schneider-Brown, Michael Mater, Jackie Halliday, and Steve Welch of IEEE, who work on developing and, de and delivering the webinar series. Thank you, team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact us via the email address visible on the site, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we move on to our presenter, we thought it would be great to remind you about E4C, or Engineering for Change, and who we are. E4C is a global community of now over 800,000 people, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists who work together to solve humanitarian challenges faced by underserved communities around the world, such as access to potable water, off-grid energy, effective healthcare, agriculture, and sanitation, amongst others. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. Membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition, as well as access to a passionate and engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy and it's free. Check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. The webinar you're participating in today is one installment of our webinar series. It's a free publicly available series of online seminars showcasing the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field. Information on upcoming installments in this series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C webinars webpage. You see the URL listed right there along with our YouTube channel, though URL is also listed. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd also like to take a moment to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C Webinars. E4C's next webinar will be on April 29th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and our topic will be Engineering for Global Development, Reflections on the Profession. This webinar is part of a series exploring careers at the intersection of technology and global development. Stay tuned to the E4C webinars page for registration details. If you're already an E4C member, we'll be sending you an invitation to the webinar directly. So we have a, quite a few folks attending this webinar, so let's see where everyone is from today. Using the group chat, please type in your location now. And I already see that we have folks who have indicated that uh, they're joining us from Afghanistan. Um, I know we have folks from the United States, Piscato, New Jersey, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Perfect. Let us know where you're coming from. Connecticut. A few folks from Wisconsin. <laughs> Perth, Australia. We have Tulsa and Toronto, Canada. Very cool. London, UK. We're, we're so thrilled that all of us could, all of you could join us today. It's uh, fantastic to see folks from all over the world. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour or PDH, um, please follow the instructions at the top of our webpage and you see the URL listed. Also, please make sure to take a moment to fill out our short survey. Your opinions are invaluable to the webinar series, and without your comments and suggestions, we wouldn't be where we are today. I see more folks, Atlanta, Saudi Arabia, 
Linwood, Washington. There you go. Thank you all. All right. So with that, I would like to take a moment to introduce today's presenter. Joe Fernandez is the founder and executive director of uh, Trade Without Borders and Sola Joe. Joe has served as an advisor to graduate student to graduate student energy and the environmental workshop at the Columbia University and also served as an expert advisor to the common pitch 2011 winner Bright Products and venture of the Bell Solar Lab. Joseph is a member of several working groups of the UN Foundation's Energy Access Practitioners Network, including Supply Chain, and has served as a guest lecturer on social enterprise at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. We're thrilled to have Joe with us today, and I'm going to turn it over to him to take us to the rest of the webinar. Okay, thank you very much, Jana, for that uh, nice introduction. Um, uh, again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever part of the world you are. Uh, I, myself, am based in Hong Kong. So it's about uh, a little after 10 p.m. over here, um, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful actually to, to, to Engineering for Change for agreeing to my request to move the webinar one hour earlier, otherwise it would have been about 11 p.m. Uh, that we would be uh, getting started, and I guess my concern was I may have dozed off during the course of the presentation, so this is definitely a little better for me. Um, so let's get started here. So I, I, I just want to uh, explain to you, I guess, a little bit more about uh, Trade with our boards and, and, and Solagio, those are the two icon, uh, logos that you see on there. So Trade with our boards, I uh, founded uh, about uh, eight years ago, initially as a nonprofit entity in, in the U.S., and about five years ago, we, we established a for-profit entity here in Hong Kong. Um, and so in, in, in tandem, I guess you could say it's a hybrid social enterprise by, by definition. And the Solagio platform, as, as Jana mentioned, is an online platform for for clean energy products, which we launched just uh, last year and in the process of further developing and, and, and scaling up. And basically, with, with uh, uh, what I will be presenting or sharing with you today is um, the um, uh, experience, I guess, we've gained uh, uh, in the work with Trade with Our Borders and the Solagio platform. Um, and in particular, uh, the focus has been on extending uh, the support services, if you will, trading services to both uh, global suppliers, uh, in the case of the Solagio platform of clean energy products, as well as in uh, local buyers. So there, we find there are a lot of um, uh, uh, product suppliers out there, there's a lot of organizations working on the ground, but no one had been sort of uh, addressing the challenges then in facilitating the flow of the products then from the global suppliers to uh, 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 to the lo local buyers. So that's really um, uh, uh, a major area of our fo focus. Um, so on the part of our our high vision, if you will, what we you know, hope to do in the world uh, that we live in um, is to contribute to sustainable development through responsible and inclusive trade of impact products. So that's the high-level vision, uh, and then bringing that down to our, our mission, uh, which is to create this, uh, social, economic, and environmental impact within underserved communities uh, by expanding access to impactful products, and uh, again, with uh, clean energy being the focus of of Solagio. Um, but uh, certainly with trade with our borders, uh, 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 we, we would hope to be able to do the same thing then with, with other categories of product and expanding the flow of healthcare supplies and, and, and so forth. So uh, Jan has done a very good job already uh, uh, presenting uh, myself here, so I won't uh, talk more about myself, but get right on to the topic here. Um, about some of the challenges then that we confront in actually facilitating the, this uh, huge gap that exists between global suppliers and local buyers. So um, while there certainly is um, a, you know, a big gap, uh, you could say, um, in the availability of appropriate, affordable, and good quality products specifically for developing regions of the world, uh, on the other hand, you do have, um, in the case of, let's say, solar lanterns, you do have a, a, a number of solutions that exist already, and uh, there are many uh, university departments, for example, engineering departments, where students or professors are, are working on, on the next great thing, uh, the next great impact product. And I have, a, 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 over the years, I've had lots of conversations with with the uh, professors or, 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 or students about their products and, and, and um, discussing with them how to um, scale up production or, or, or uh, things for them to think about in, 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 in getting their products to people who can benefit from them. Um, but the, 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 um, 
the, the bigger challenge, uh, uh, like I said, is probably uh, beyond the products is how do you then cost effectively scale up production of the, those products uh, while uh, but doing it cost effect effectively but still ensuring the good, the good quality of those products and how do you efficiently deliver then those products to the local communities um, and how do you do it all in a financially viable and sustainable manner. So that's sort of the, the, the high level challenge. And then breaking down uh, that challenge, uh, those challenges, if you will, and looking specifically at product suppliers. So with suppliers, um, uh, they're primarily looking at uh, uh, getting their products manufactured in low cost markets in order to ensure the affordability of the products. And um, uh, you have the little icon for China there. And uh, of course, I'm based in Hong Kong. So a lot of what I will talk about as far as um, uh, product sourcing or manufacturing will be uh, will have a China lens to it, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, what I have to share with you will apply uh, irrespective of the uh, low cost market that you choose to manufacture your product. Um, uh, and the, the other challenge, so with the supplier, it, it may be getting that production scaled up in that low cost market, and then of course if you've got that sorted out, then it's, it's getting the, the, the distribution sorted out from your product, uh, for your product, from those um, suppliers to the local buyers. Uh, and then if you're a buyer, and in particular since the focus is on developing regions of the world, uh, what we find really is that um, so certainly there, there are you know, a, a number of NGOs and, and uh, of, uh, various uh, local enterprises, um, but a, a general characteristic if you're talking actually about the buyers are serving those local communities, um, there are a lot of small and medium organizations. Um, and uh, by nature, those small and medium organizations, they do not have the, um, the, the, the resources um, uh, of, let's say, a major big box retailer or a major importer in a, in a developed market. So for them to uh, go about accessing those quality products that are uh, being needed in their communities is a huge challenge. And then, of course, managing the, if they have identified those products, managing the supply chain to get those products to their, their local communities is, is, is a significant challenge as well. So just to summarize sort of a, at a high level the challenges, um, you don't have a single uh, uh, path between those global suppliers and these local buyers. And particularly talking about developing countries, uh, that, that pathway, if you will, between supplier and buyer is uh, even more, uh, uh, an even more winding, uh, even more steep path, um, and, and um, definitely not as streamlined as supply chains uh, may be to, to, to developed markets. So um, what I'd like to uh, uh, move on to now, so from, from, from that high-level view, if you will, of the challenges, is just get into some specifics then of product procurement, product development, and global supply chain management. So the good news is uh, Jack and Belinda Gates Foundation is hiring a procurement manager. So if you are the lucky person who is selected as a procurement manager, then the questions for you would be where to begin going about procuring the supplies that you need to. And in this case, uh, just in this example, uh, we'll use school supplies um, uh, uh, as, as the example of the products you're looking to procure. So where to begin and what are the steps you're going to go through then to qualify the products and the suppliers? And what are the challenges and how are you going to overcome those challenges in, in making it all work? So first of all, um, you know, you may, uh, if you're, you're, you're looking to procure, you may go online and you may, um, um, uh, many people are familiar with Alibaba.com and there are many other uh, online sites like globalsources.com. And you may find, in fact, uh, you know, a display of, of a, a number of different school supplies, let's say. Uh, but the thing to, I guess, uh, be aware of is uh, when you get onto those, those online sites, um, uh, you're, you're, and you may access then the, the website of the, of the manufacturer. Uh, I guess the thing to keep in mind is that uh, literally anyone can create a beautiful website. So you really don't know uh, who is behind then the products that are, are featured on, uh, on that online platform. Um, and you may not even know if you're actually dealing with, with a factory or it might be a trading company or some other kind of entity. And, um, you know, it, it may not be a bad thing to, to work with, with, with a trading company rather than directly with the manufacturer uh, if you're looking to procure products and certainly something like school supplies where you're talking about lots of little stuff and, and many different kinds of little stuff and may be more practical to work with the trading company. Um, uh, but then uh, the words I have at the top of the slide 
caveat emptor, uh, which is a, a, a Latin for buyer beware. You still need to be aware of, of uh, the, the entity that you might be dealing with. And I just give you a couple of examples. So one customer that we're working with right now, uh, this is something that happened fairly recently uh, 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 with them. So there's a supplier that they've been working with for at least uh, one year, if not longer. And, um, and the, the, the last order that they, they confirmed with the supplier, they received the pro forma invoice uh, from the supplier um, uh, uh, with uh, all the product details and their updated banking information. And they went about confirming the order and, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, taking care of the wire transfer uh, for the deposit um, uh, to the manufacturer. And uh, lo and behold, they, they learned later in the follow-up communications with the manufacturer that um, they had never received the deposit, and moreover, the, the, the manufacturer never sent the pro forma invoice to them. So it was actually somebody else who had um, uh, uh, was posing as, as, as the factory and provided their own bank account details. And so the money uh, basically went to, to, to the wrong account in this case. Um, uh, there, there are also situations where you have a, a, rep, a, a marketing representative, let's say, of a factory, you know, who works for a factory and promoting uh, the factory's products, uh, but maybe his good friend works for another factory and he will advise his buyer that I uh, have a great new product um, to, to, to introduce to you, um, which he will, uh, will promote, he or she will promote as um, uh, his or her uh, own factory's product. Well, in fact, it's, it's coming from somewhere else. Uh, um, and like I said, it could be even another uh, a trading company uh, that's just handling this, the, this product. Um, and uh, uh, an actual situation uh, uh, that, that we've confronted with that. And then the, the owner of the factory uh, you know, uh, uh, came to us and said, do you know uh, of the situation? And we had to provide lots of uh, uh, you know, supporting emails with, with this person and things like that because they filed a, a, a court case against uh, the, the, the employer filed a court case against the, the employee. And uh, unfortunately, we were involved in having to provide a lot of the supporting emails and things like that. So, so again, the, 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 the main point here is, is, is buyer beware in, in terms of really uh, knowing and understanding who you're actually uh, dealing with. Um, so let's say you do have the factory um, uh, uh, sorted out uh, for your products. Um, so how do you go about then, uh, ensuring the quality of that factory or the, uh, of the products that you're uh, working with? Um, so there are a few different things to keep in mind, and uh, it'd be kind of difficult. It probably would be a, a webinar topic unto itself in terms of how you go about qualifying your factories. Uh, but I'll just uh, touch on a few quick uh, points here. Uh, first of all, the extent of the experience that the factory has with that particular category of products that, that you are looking to, to procure. So, for example, a factory may uh, feature a new solar lantern that they, that they um, are introducing to, to buyers, and you may like the product, it looks good, and everything like that. But if you dig deeper, um, uh, what you may find is that uh, the factory's make, main product line is actually candles, for example, or something completely not related to, to, to solar lanterns. And maybe somebody came to them and said, hey, you deal with lighting products, so how about making a solar lantern for us? And, uh, and, and they, they, they went about you know, uh, uh, sourcing the, 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 the material for a solar lantern and assembling the lanterns, but not having any of the testing equipment um, uh, in place. So having that product-specific experience can certainly be helpful uh, when you're looking at, at um, uh, uh, qualifying the factory. But there are a number of, uh, a number of other things. But the, the basics are, do they have proper income and quality control for the components coming in? Do they have quality systems on the production line? Do they have uh, systems in place to inspect the goods, the finished goods? And depending on, on the type of product that you are working with, uh, uh, are, are they undertaking reliability testing and then asking lots of questions about what kind of reliability testing uh, uh, they do and for how long and, and, and so forth there. And of course, besides quality, then um, uh, uh, the social responsibility access um, uh, can be important. So if you're preparing for UNICEF and ensuring there's no child labor, for example, would of course be very important. And then there are environmental considerations, and then uh, there's um, uh, a lot of issues then um, you can get into when you're looking at, at social and environmental issues. And again, um, uh, that probably could be, uh, again, a, a webinar topic unto itself. Um, um, but getting now more into then uh, looking at, at then how do you go about qualifying the products themselves? 
So one thing that you might look at is, is uh, to what extent is the manufacturer vertically integrated with the manufacturing. So it's not, it, it, it will be very common that the factory will outsource um, various different, uh, various processes, um, uh, procure components from different vendors and so forth. Um, uh, but the vertical integration uh, uh, can be helpful in certain categories of product. For example, if you take a product like a mobile phone charger device uh, and the mobile phone connectors that would then connect to the, an iPhone or Samsung phone or a Nokia phone, for example. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, in China, public tools, for example. Um, and the problem with the public tools is you don't have any um, proper control in terms of uh, uh, how that tool is made and uh, and and the the plastic parts that that that, that are, are are produced using that public tool. While if a factory has a tooling capabilities in house for those connectors and they're doing their own plastic injection, chances are the quality of those connectors are going to be much 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 better. Um, and then what kind of testing is done uh, for the products? Um, and uh, um, um, particularly when 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 you you approach. Uh, 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 factories uh, who may, for example, have experience supplying to the European market and they're familiar with all of the um, European certifications, CE and so forth there. Uh, but if you approach the factory, and this has happened many, many, many times uh, uh, um, in the case of TWB, where we uh, um, communicate to the factory, okay, the, the market uh, for this product or the target market is in Africa. And uh, what you will get then is then the quotation for the product with absolutely no testing included in, in, in the price that's quoted because the factory is assuming that you do not need any testing whatsoever for your product because it's going to to, to Africa. So that's their presumption, incorrect uh, presumption, uh, or they may have had experience, unfortunately, with uh, perhaps uh, traders uh, from certain markets who don't care about their quality. They're just looking at the lowest price. And so they're just getting the lowest uh, quality product at the lowest price, adding up their margin. And, uh, you know, once they've been able to successfully sell the product, they, of course, do not care about anything um, um, after sales service or anything else uh, about those products. And certainly um, those who have spent time in, in, in many of these markets uh, know that many of them are flooded with, with uh, lots of lots of uh, low quality uh, products from uh, from China, so, um, uh, and like I said, it's a kind of unfortunate situation. But 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 you will have even good quality factories that know about testing, that have testing processes in place, but they just uh, are are assuming that that uh, your 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 requirements are going to be different if you're if you're um, going to be supplying products for for developing region. So that testing is something you you uh, you definitely have to um, verify and confirm and 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 reconfirm. And, and double check. The other thing then is, is uh, just the you know uh, some of the technical competencies of uh, uh, of the factories in particularly um, uh, uh, in in the particular product that that you're you're dealing with. So um, on the part of trade without borders, um, you know we, we we have well established processes in place, and what you see here is just sort of a very high level um, you know flow chart um, um, that outlined uh, uh, at a very high level kind of what we might uh, go through when we're looking at, at, at procuring products. So uh, every product that's on this larger platform uh, that's been procured or, or products that we uh, have uh, helped to develop ourselves, uh, you know, uh, are, are, are fully vetted products and uh, uh, the, the factory will have been checked, the product will have been fully vetted, and uh, the factory will have been audited before we're, we're including products on, on, on the site. So this is just uh, for your reference, again, a very high-level view of uh, our, our product procurement process, but of course there are a lot, a lot more details uh, uh, involved in the process as well. Okay, so moving from now product procurement, then and looking at uh, new product development. So um, one thing, uh, there's the 80-20 rule in a lot of different environments, and that certainly is true when you're looking at uh, uh, new product development, uh, let's say in in mainland China. Uh, and the way the 80-20 rule would apply then in China when you're looking at product uh, development is you'll find that most of the products that get designed and developed and therefore the experience of the factories um, is on product design and development for the developed markets. So they, um, 
and and it, it, it's the, the simple reason is that uh, the the those who invest in product design and development tend to be buyers of companies from developed markets. So there are very few from sub-Saharan Africa who are uh, bringing uh, you know designs to 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 manufacturers over here. Um, so um, uh, in w- w- one product that we ourselves uh, uh, help to develop and bring to the market is a DC LED TV. Um, and we introduced the product to the market in, in 2013, and uh, last year it was a finalist for the Global Leap Award and so forth. Um, and one challenge that you find with, with, with the TV category is that, um, you know, almost um, uh, 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 the vast, vast majority of the TVs, manu- the most TVs are manufactured in China, but the vast majority of them are large screen TVs that consume a lot of power. And so virtually um, uh, uh, very, very few TVs of a smaller size, uh, more energy efficient and so forth, that would be more appropriate for off-grid communities in developing regions. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, very few of those are, are actually available. So we, we, um, when we went about looking for, uh, you know, to, to develop the TV, this is what we found. Um, and so we actually had to do a lot of work on, on ourselves in terms of educating uh, the factory that we, we, we ended up uh, working with to develop the TV and to help them understand what the market potential might be that you have this huge uh, underserved market uh, that has uh, a, a demand for, for, uh, for such a product, for a small screen, uh, uh, highly energy efficient TV. So that's what we're one of the, the, the fundamental challenges uh, 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 that, that you might encounter uh, in, in just getting started with, with your product development project. Um, now the, the the focus here is not on necessarily product design that would be a separate topic, but let's say you've, you've got your design sorted out and you're ready to scale up the the, the manufacturing uh, of that particular product uh, that you've uh, established the design for. So the, the the first thing here is when you look at factory or factory selection, uh, and it's a product development project as opposed to a product procurement project. So something uh, where you're procuring uh, off the shelf an existing product to factory manufacturers as opposed to taking a new product idea to a factory, uh, the factory selection process, process is actually different because you want a different type of factory to work on a proprietary um, uh, uh, product um, that you are looking to develop with your ideas and so forth. So there is a difference in, in, in the factory selection process. And then there are a few other things that, that really should go into uh, the, the, the factory selection process, and this is looking at the sort of the longer term supply chain uh, uh, issues in, in getting a product manufactured and, and, and uh, uh, delivered to your target markets. So the location of the factory, so most manufacturing in China, for example, on the coastal areas, uh, not surprisingly, with the, the access to the, to the port facilities. Um, uh, but you, you, you also may, uh, um, uh, so, so the, the location is also important and when you're looking at, uh, you know, what are the, um, the uh, supporting uh, uh, supplier base, if you will, that may be required for the particular product that you are looking to develop. So uh, there are, uh, for example, if you're looking at vacuum cleaners, there are certain uh, uh, areas in China that are very strong in vacuum cleaners and there's a lot of surrounding uh, uh, supplier base of motors that are suitable for uh, you know vacuum cleaners for example you know so 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 uh, having an understanding of the of the uh, surrounding supplier base if you will uh, for the components that are going to be necessary uh, would be something important to 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 consider as well and uh, uh, and generally speaking that that, that is a, a huge advantage that China in general has so even if you're you're looking to set up manufacturing let's say in west uh, west africa um uh, for example, so you may be able to get the factory set up, get the equipment there, and everything like that. Uh, but a big challenge is probably going to be getting uh, getting the, the the materials that you need then to actually um, uh, manufacture the product in that particular location. And you may, in fact, have to resort to then bringing uh, components and so forth from China or 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 you know Germany or U.S. or or, or elsewhere. So uh, that fundamentally is 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 a major advantage in in general when we talk about manufacturing in, in China. Uh, intellectual property, again, that, that, that also could be a, a webinar topic uh, unto itself. But generally, what, what I would say is that um, you kind of have to strike a balance 
in terms of you, you need to undertake all the due diligence that you would expect to undertake in protecting your intellectual property. Um, but there's a, a, a statistic I came across where uh, by something like 97% of, of um, uh, money that is spent on, uh, on product patents, uh, um, the, the, the return on, on that investment, if you will, on that, on that patent uh, is, is, never, is never realized. Um, because for, for, for various reasons, uh, the, it turns out you, you, you pay the lawyer, you, you do the patent filing, you find that there is something uh, already in existence that's very similar to, to what you had in mind or for whatever reason your product never gets to market or by the time it gets to market, uh, something else has been introduced that, that, that's even better and, and, and cheaper than, than, than what you had in mind. So, so, so there are strategies for, for intellectual property, uh, but again, that would probably be a separate topic unto itself. But one thing when you're looking at setting a manufacturing and scaling up the production of your proprietary product, um, you do uh, sort of have to consider how much you want to control and how much you're going to sort of open up uh, 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 to the factory and, and let the factory uh, uh, undertake and, and, and take on. So one thing you don't want to do is, is reinvent the wheel, uh, so to speak. There, um, you know, but there are issues like who will pay for the tooling. So if you can convince the factory of the potential of your product, you may have them undertake the tooling, and that may be fine if the plastic housing for your product is is, is less of an issue. Um, you know, uh, if, if it's like certain key components that uh, that's inside the product, and you control that, and maybe you get that even manufactured uh, 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 at a completely separate. Uh, uh, a, a, a facility there. So, you know, if you take, for example, a Philips light bulb, um, you know, how much of that light bulb is actually, uh, you know, uh, owned, if you will, by Philips, and how much actually is just, uh, you know, uh, things that they push onto the factory, whether it's, it's uh, you know, they may spec- uh, uh, give the factory the specifications of the driver, but it might be the factory that, 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 that manufactures the driver, for example, but maybe the PCB A is, is, is done by by Philip. So, so there, there are different ways in terms of really going about uh, um, setting up your, 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 your product development project. But the thing is basically to save costs and to, to, um, to scale up the, the manufacturing that much faster. It's better to really um, push as much as makes sense uh, 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 to the factory itself. Okay. Uh, and, 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 but, but just try to control certain key things about, about your product. So, um, so besides procurement and, and then product development, then just getting into other, um, uh, let's say, uh, issues to, to keep in mind. Uh, so if you've sorted out your factory, you've got the manufacturing uh, scaled up, you're ready to, to go to market, uh, quality management then becomes an issue. And quality management, when you're talking about uh, China, is basically perpetual, nonstop, ongoing. Uh, you, you always, always, always have to stay on top of it. And uh, just a, a couple of uh, reasons why. Uh, for example, you may have changes in the marketplace for certain key components for your product. Um, you know, and and uh, we've had that situation, for example, with, with, with our LED TV. Just the, the the nature of the supply for LCD panels change for for the small panels. Um, and so there was that change, but uh, fortunately, uh, with the factory we work with, they explained uh, what the dynamics were in, in, in the marketplace for LCD panels, and, uh, you know, and we worked with them to ensure that the, the, the new type of panel was still going to um, uh, meet our, our requirements and, and so forth, but you can have uh, uh, dynamics where, 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 where components uh, or the, the market for, for components changes. Uh, and if you're not careful and the factory sort of undertakes those changes, Without you really being on top of it, uh, then you know the, your, the quality of your product can suffer. Uh, or another thing could be that the factories confirmed a price to you, uh, and they have very thin margins. Uh, let's say, um, you know, but the, uh, for a number of, of reasons, uh, the price of, of, of a particular critical component uh, has gone up. You know, it could be seasonal issues, and many other issues. Uh, the, the, the raw material prices have, have gone up, and things like that. There, and so the factory will unilaterally then, um, you know, p- procure that component from a, a, a lower, um, a, a lower cost supplier uh, without informing you. And 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 you know that component is listed as a critical component in your test report and things like that. And if you're not careful, it can you know, impact the quality of your product. So. Like I said, quality management is just sort of an ongoing issue that you have to have to keep in mind. 
The other thing then is, is after sales service. So, so what kind of warranty are you providing on your product and what kind of service are you, uh, you may even be legally required to provide for your product? In, in some Middle East countries, for example, you have to provide five years uh, warranty for your product, and, uh, which, is, which is really uh, uh, highly impractical. And what you'll find is, of course, uh, um, you know, uh, and of course, with, with technology products, you have rapid changes. I talked about the LCD panel for the TV, uh, but but even if you're talking about a more basic uh, panel, basically, uh, I'm sorry, a more basic product, uh, the, the 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 life cycle of that product, uh, even at the factory level, maybe let's say a couple of years. Um, so if the, the factory has a rechargeable uh, radio that they've introduced, um, you know, the the you know a couple of years later, they've got uh, new radios that they're introducing, and 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 that, that two-year-old uh, radio, the uh, the spare parts are no longer available, and and so on and so forth. There, so it, it's something to 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 keep in mind and think about. Um, you know, w- w- what is the situation going to be for, uh, 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 for spare parts? Are you know, and depending on the kind of warranty and after sales service that you're going to be offering for for your product. The other things then, uh, uh, quickly to keep in mind, China export considerations, local import considerations, and then strategic management of your, of your operations. With China export considerations, the key things there are um, with factories in China, um, they have, uh, well, first of all, uh, what you need to know is do they have uh, a license to export the particular product that you are manufacturing there? So they may, for example, deal with school supplies, but they may not necessarily, and they may have a, a, a license to export, but it may not be for the particular uh, uh, you know, product that, 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 that you are sourcing uh, from the factory or that you choose to, to develop for the factory. So that particular product ha- uh, will, may need to be registered with the proper authorities in order to be exported from China. The other uh, uh, place where you might run into uh, uh, export issues is, is if you're buying small quantity of product and then you're looking to consolidate those products, well, a, a factory may get, uh, for example, a tax rebate uh, uh, for the product that they are exporting. If they sell in the domestic market, they could put a, set, a 17% VAT. So for the factory, it's very important to get the proper documentation back uh, showing that they exported their product. And if you're consolidating product, then there's a lot more paperwork and things like that that you, you have to take care of. So, so those are some of the export considerations. And then on the import side is, of course, then um, you, you may have issues where you have to uh, have the product registered or, or, or the proper um, uh, uh, a certificate of conformity, for example, in many East African markets, uh, uh, for example, for, for uh, uh, many, many, many categories of product. And so you just need to be aware of what those uh, requirements are to obtain that certificate, certificate of conformity and make sure that the factory or the product that you're preparing from the factory, um, you know, uh, are, are going to meet all of those, those, those requirements. Right? And then um, getting into then, you know, so if you are going to scale up your manufacturing and you got something that, that that's really good, then then you need to think through in terms of what your your, your operations, uh, how you're going to manage your operations. Are you going to be able to manage it remotely, um, you know, from your office in in Nairobi, or do you need to engage a, a, a an, an, an agent who's not on your payroll but that you're paying a commission to, uh, or uh, uh, you know, do you need to hire China staff? Um, you know, and, and one thing to keep in mind there is that, uh, uh, so at the factory level, there's uh, uh, um, uh, wages paid to factory workers, but if you're talking about uh, someone based in Shenzhen, uh, China, for example, who's, uh, you know, with a university degree, maybe an engineering, engineering degree who speaks English or Spanish or whatever your requirement uh, could be, uh, it, the, 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 it may cost you a bit more to, to hire that person than, than, than you may expect. Um, uh, and then, of course, you may choose to set up your China office and then deal with all of the administrative overheads there. Uh, so moving just quickly then beyond, um, you know, the, the, the product and, and um, the, well, let's say the, the manufacturing side of things and then looking then at um, then, then actually getting your product to uh, uh, different developing, developing regions. So... Um, you know, and particularly the, 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 the shop owner in Uganda or, or that women's cooperative in, in India, for example. Um, and one of the, the, the things, I guess, that we uh, have seen is um, the, the, uh, the, going back to what I said previously about there being a lot of small and medium enterprises, a lot of smaller scale uh, uh, buyers that you might be looking at. And a fundamental thing, I guess, uh, I would say is that if you're going to be um, able to, so I cannot comment about 
uh, you know, uh, distribution in each individual country, but I'm just talking about things more on a global level and something that, that uh, would seem to be consistent uh, regardless of the, the individual market is at the local level, do you have the capability in, or, uh, in, in order to be able to aggregate uh, product requests? Because there will be a lot more smaller product requests from individual buyers in developing regions, and do you have the system in place, uh, whatever that, that, that particular model may be, in order to be able to aggregate uh, uh, product requests? Um, and then the other thing is then do you have a supply chain management system uh, at the local level and that can extend globally? Um, and so when you talk about developed countries, for the most part, there are a lot of very efficient supply chain management systems. Uh, but again, those, uh, just like uh, when I was talking about products being designed for developed markets with supply chain management uh, resources. So if you talk about information communications technologies to help you manage your supply chain uh, operations, um, so if I go to a software vendor in Hong Kong, for example, and to inquire about their supply chain management solution, inevitably uh, their solution will have been uh, designed to cater to, for example, a big box retailer in North America or, or Europe. So you don't really have a lot of um, uh, you know, uh, effective supply chain management um, uh, tools, if you will, uh, to, uh, to serve the, the, the uh, distribution situation in developing regions. And so, uh, um, uh, uh, and there are, of course, uh, a number of organizations, um, uh, social enterprises and so forth that are uh, you know, actively working on, on bringing um, more and better solutions to, 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 to address this. But fundamentally, th those are two things. Uh, are you able to aggregate and are, are, are you able then to tap into some kind of a supply chain management system in order to, to, to create, make things as efficient um, uh, uh, as possible in, in, in managing those, those supply chains? Um, so just to sort of move towards closing here and bring it back to the, the Solagio platform. So basically what we are really, um, you know, uh, working at, uh, hard at, uh, taking all of these issues, uh, various issues that I've mentioned in procuring and, 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 and developing product, uh, but, but uh, again, it, it's, it's beyond product. It's, it's looking at the, the supply chain processes and what our hope is to be able to, you know, uh, collaborate with and leverage a lot of existing um, uh, solutions uh, uh, that are out there, but to, to uh, just like we might with, with products and, and making sure they're appropriate for developing regions to, to, to develop more of these supply chain resources um, and bring these into the larger platform so that we can better serve um, uh, underserved markets in, in developing regions. So I'll um, skip over these uh, case studies because uh, uh, it's getting a bit late here. Um, and uh, I guess we can open up to, to questions. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, you caught me a little bit off guard there. I wasn't ready quite <laughs> to I was in the slides. But uh, I do appreciate yeah. it. This has been incredibly insightful, so much deep knowledge. And as you said a number of times, uh, there's topics uh, that you covered uh, very quickly or lightly that are other webinars onto themselves. And in fact, if anybody in the listening audience uh, is interested in, in um, exploring some of these topics deeperly or deeper, please feel free to, to let us know and, and we will maybe work with Joe again to develop that kind of uh, offering. So uh, with uh, this in mind, I, I would like to open it up to uh, questions uh, from our attendees regarding product development and procurement. And uh, uh, we have some coming in already, so I'll tackle the first one here. Um, Joe, how often do you audit after the initial audit, and what metrics do you use to know when to audit suppliers? Okay. Um, so definitely when we you know, first make, make contact with, with the factory before, so we will go through that process uh, you know, of qualifying. The, we will have a checklist uh, with the factory if they don't. Um, meet all our requirements on that checklist, and we're not taking things further. Um, you know, so if we qualify the, the the product and the factory at that first level, then we do the, the more detailed audit. Um, and um, so, in in we will you know have the personal visit uh, uh, to the factory. We've basically sort of developed our own in-house quality systems audit, and this is based on you know the almost 20 years of experience that I've had working with manufacturers in China and working with, you know, looking at the, the, the audit systems of, uh, you know, companies like Tesco in the UK and, uh, you know, the, the, the Walmarts of the world and, and major importers um, in, 
uh, around the world, a lot of uh, uh, you know large companies. Uh, so I, I've interacted with with the likes of uh, GE. On uh, you know uh, one client was working on a proprietary product that uh, they obtained a, a license from GE for the product for. So we were dealing with with GE and their their quality systems and so forth. So so we, we basically sort of uh, you know took the the, the best uh, um, uh, examples out there and tried to bring that then in house into uh, establish our own quality systems uh, uh, process uh, for the factory. Um, uh, and then beyond that, uh, there are uh, on the social front. Then uh, uh, we have there there are, uh, a checklist of about you know uh, ten key items um, um, for the most part that that, that we look at, um, and a, a lot of these things are, are fairly standard. And a lot of the the uh, the entities, the uh, like SGS and 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 others that uh, can conduct these these uh, social audits. Um, these are Fairly standard um, uh, things that they look at. Uh, the dormitory facilities, uh, you know, are they separate from the manufacturing? Is there proper fire escapes and uh, a number of other things? Um, you know, and then environmental audit is, is then you know, uh, uh, completely separate. And for us, I would say the you know the the the, the auditing. Uh, I mean, in, in principle, um, uh, I think uh, many companies will will require an, an annual audit that the factory uh, must require. In our case, we're sort of, um, you know, um, uh, there at the factory uh, uh, regularly, and so we're uh, so, uh, in, in a way, uh, ensuring the ongoing um, uh, systems uh, uh, at the factory is uh, uh, almost like the, the uh, not quite as intense as the you know, ongoing quality quality assurance for products, but uh, the, the awareness, if you will, is always there. So it's it's, it's also ongoing on stuff. Um, so. so uh, it's difficult to, to talk about specific uh, metrics here. Uh, like I said, there are a lot of existing metrics that, that we ourselves have you know, adopted or, or incorporated. So I, I hope that uh, addresses the, the question to some level. Cool. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in uh, specifically driving at the, the practicalities or the, the issues associated with interacting with factories. One question here is, uh, how do you go about getting the factory to finalize the design and manufacturing process of a patented product idea without having to use money out of pocket? Is that possible? Uh, <laughs> well, it, it, I, I mean, uh, uh, you know, like they say, I guess everything is, is, is possible. And, and so the, 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 the thing is, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I I had a friend who you know worked for Mercedes Benz in in Beijing, and uh, you know and uh, experience they had. So they had uh, you know it was required for Mercedes Benz to have a joint venture partner to manufacture their 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 automobiles in in China, and uh, you know lo and behold they you know, found the, the their JV partner. Uh, you know this is a joint venture partner who was, was you know adopted their uh, you know door design into the door and the, the uh, uh, car doors that were being you know manufactured by that company mm -hmm. for for their own cars uh, uh, for the, the 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 domestic market. So uh, yes, you can you know go through all the due diligence process. You can um, you know sign your non compete non disclosure agreements. You can uh, you know uh, uh, and w whatever agreement you are going to sign, uh, you know uh, make sure that you do have a Chinese version. Whatever if you're Native language is English, and you may be comfortable having uh, something in English, but make sure you have a Chinese version. Um, uh, uh, you know, and 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 you know, as, and there are you know, if you have the, a good lawyer, the right lawyer, uh, including one um, who can write things appropriately in, in in the Chinese language, then there are certain wordings that you can incorporate to try to make it as broad and general as possible. Um, you know, to to protect yourself as as much as possible because it's very easy to you know get around. So just someone makes a slight adjustment to what is your patented technology, uh, and in China it's not going to be protected. Uh, you know, so so just uh, how you work things and everything. So so uh, the short answer is yes, it is possible. But uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah. as with, with with many other things, there are there are a lot of. Uh, um, uh, things that you need to be aware of if you are going to you know, put those agreements in place. That's great advice. Uh, another question related to uh, engaging with these kinds of factories is uh, how can you push a factory to give a breakdown of parts or supplier costs for all of the components? Is this something that is usually given to the buyer of the product? 
Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you thought you were, were talking about a, a product uh, uh, um, development situation. Uh, in mm-hmm. that case, then uh, yes, and then you know, and uh, uh, and particularly if you're, uh, you know, uh, uh, investing a significant portion of of, of of the money to to get the product developed. But even if you, if you're not, then yeah, it's perfectly reasonable to to uh, uh, to request information on. The component suppliers and 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 the costs that are uh, uh, going to be in, involved there, and uh, you know they're uh, so so it, it it would be perfectly acceptable in order to to do that and to make that request. Yes. Fantastic. Um, we're going to get to a little bit more of a philosophical question here, which is um, <laughs> with uh, the. It's almost consumers. 11 p.m. <laughs> I know, it's almost going to be on the philosophy. It's philosophical. Uh, <laughs> hey, the questions get asked. I, I have a, a job to do here. Uh, so the question that came in is regarding the end buyers or the end drivers of the manufacturing, and specifically if those end buyers are foundations, NGOs, or external entities that are buying quote-unquote social products, won't this continue to distort local markets and supply chains? Okay. <laughs> Uh, mm. yeah, so, so, so on the part of well, on the part of, of, of uh, you know, Solidio, so we we do work uh, both on the supplier side and and the uh, you know buyer side, if you will, uh, with uh, with NGOs also. With um, you know, uh, so we 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 have a supplier of, of Solar Light that, that that's a nonprofit entity in the U.S. They mainly uh, you know um, uh, get uh, donated funds, and they're mainly Selling their products to NGOs that are donating the 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 the, the lights, uh, uh, for example. Um, but uh, you know, uh, uh, the basically, and and you know, it, it is definitely going to 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 um, create uh, uh, adverse impacts if you're then looking at the you know commercial suppliers of of uh, solar lights, uh, for example. So mm-hmm. so the what, what what we have done is uh, you know, but it was. Um, the, uh, so, so this is actually one of these um, case studies in, in, in the slide, um, and uh, but we helped them to, to first of all lower the manufacturing costs uh, for the light, so it was even more affordable. And um, um, that light uh, is, is actually on on our site uh, um, uh, right now, and we, uh, you know, and, and they realize that their distribution reach is going to be limited. If they're just working through NGOs and and you know as as donated product and and that's just the reality, you, you, there there are you know significant constraints to being able to scale up distribution just working through through a, a donation model. Now I, I'm I'm not talking you know there are mosquito uh, uh, net suppliers that just do you know uh, 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 procurement large procurement contracts and they're able to you know. Supply a, a million uh, uh, mosquito nets, for example. And that's all they do. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but but, but uh, with with many organizations that that are that are are, are you know just working on a donation based model, there are limits to to how much they can scale up their their distribution. And so with this particular client, uh, you know our our um, intent is to work with them to establish more commercial um, you know channels uh, of distribution for their product in order to actually. Scale up um, uh, um, uh, distribution even more and get their lights to you know more more underserved communities. So there is definitely uh, an issue and a problem, I would say, in terms of you know donated products getting out there. They do mm-hmm. interfere. Uh, it's not sustainable. All of those things. Uh, so absolutely yes. And so to the extent, that, but th- th- there's always sort of a balancing act, and I guess to the extent that we can, um, you know, uh, take those. <laughs> Issues of the of the NGO, but but uh, you know, uh, 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 help them to understand also, uh, uh, um, um, you know, because uh, uh, for them also it might be important to scale up, uh, like I said, uh, this to expand, expand uh, mm-hmm. you know the, the, uh, their work and to help to work with them to find ways to do that in more viable and sustainable ways. Got you. So there, there's a there's a question that came in um, that's very specific uh, regarding uh, trade without borders and and your engagements and you mentioned obviously a number of off grid energy products. Uh, the question here is: Has TWB been involved with uh, supporting the the procurement or manufacturing of agricultural products? I'm oh, sorry, other uh, other what uh, what's agricultural? What's oh, agricultural. Has TWB yeah. been involved with agricultural products? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so at, at, at this point, uh, not specifically uh, agriculture product. The thing about clean energy, though, is that it does cross, uh, you know, all sectors. 
So, uh, you know, so we have a huge demand, for example, for solar water pumps, uh, primarily for, uh, you know, uh, application in the agricultural sector. But we're not specifically dealing with, 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 uh, with, uh, agricultural products, but we are working on, on, on solar water pumps, for example. Uh, and the intent with, with trade with Abor so Solaja is, uh, as I said, leaning for, you know, focused on clean energy, but the, the, the intent is that, that once we've, Scaled up, uh, you know, I mean, we're, Solagio was just launched last year, so we're kind of in the early stages and we're, you know, uh, uh, we're looking to bring on additional financing and things like that to, to, to be able to, 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 to scale it up, uh, uh, even more. And, you know, and once we get it to a certain point, then, uh, certainly, uh, you know, and, and we, we have a, a successful model, let's say, with, with, with Solagio and the clean edge products. The idea would be to try and replicate that in, in other sectors, and uh, you know, uh, I, I'm I'm open to to consider uh, you know what the specific uh, uh, um, product requirements are for uh, for the person working with the agricultural products. If it kind of uh, if, if we can uh, uh, um, uh, help, then we will certainly try to or at least try to point the person in the in the right direction. That's fantastic. Um, I oh I I do appreciate see folks uh, sending in questions. So uh, I'm going to take two more questions only, or one question and a comment, and uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, start to roll out. But this question came in is, what would you suggest for NGOs that contract partners to conduct the work but are noticing poor quality parts, for example, poor quality PVC and, gal and galvanized pipes on the market in Uganda? So it's an NGO uh, that has uh, contracted partners, and they are uh, identifying that poor components are actually being integrated into uh, projects. Yeah. Um, so I suppose it's a question I, about I, advocacy, or what, what what channels do they have to address the issue? Yeah. So I, I think uh, it's uh, you know I probably would need to get uh, a, a bit more information because I'm not sure what the you know, relationship or contract arrangement is with, with between the NGO and their their contract partner, and you know, and if, if um, you know, to what extent things have been specified in terms of what is to be delivered and things like that. So, so you know, if, if things have been specified, if there is a, is a, a if that's in the contract, uh, then there might be you know a, a, a legal or other or recourse. Uh, but I, I really, I guess, would need a lot more information to be able to give a, a proper qualified answer. Sorry. <laughs> I think that I think that's entirely fair. And with that, I, I do encourage our attendees. Should you have additional questions for Joe, to, to reach out either to uh, the E4C webinar series, and we will put you in touch. Uh, the, you should be seeing our email address on the site right now. We apologize that we can't get to all of your questions as we are approaching time. But I would like to close this out with an interesting comment that I, I think demonstrates the, the, the power of these kinds of conversations. Uh, one of our attendees who's based in Afghanistan uh, mentioned that there is a huge market for almost anything, any product here inside Afghanistan, as not many people want to take the risk of getting involved in, in the country. So I have decided to take my first trip to China in a few months. This has been important advice for starters, and I thank you. So, uh, Joe, with that in mind, I, I do want to thank you for taking the time to, to share all of your insights with us. I, I think you have literally uh, given me ideas for three more webinars uh, around manufacturing <laughs> and product development and supply chains. And uh, based on the questions that I'm seeing from the attendees, I think there's strong agreement. So. Thank you to you for, for the time. Thank you to all of the attendees for joining us from all parts of the world. And uh, we're looking forward to connecting with all of you again next month and the months afterwards as part of the E4C webinar series. Take care. Bye-bye.